Welcome to Social Organization. Uh, this is our first class and our first lecture. And to open the class, I'd like for you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to the book of Ruth. I'm going to read the first chapter tonight. We're going to be looking at the book of Ruth over the next four weeks, and we're going to be considering the story of Ruth as a key story for understanding elements of social organization. Let's begin with the story, Ruth chapter 1. <clears throat> In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malan and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set on the, on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you've shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. And even, even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this time, they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come tonight and we just ask your blessing upon this class. Lord, we pray that as your spirit is here with us, that we would be listening to what you have to teach us. Lord, I thank you for the men and women who have come tonight. Thank you, Lord, for their desire to study, to equip themselves. Lord, to be prepared for effective ministry in whatever cultural context that you take them. And Lord, we just ask that you would use this class and the classes which follow to help them prepare themselves to be effective learners. And Lord, in that process, to be able to adapt their ministries to the people and to the cultures where they will serve. Oh Lord, we commit this hour to you. We commit this time to you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> As we think about this particular story, the first thing I would like to do is look at the literary structure of this particular text. The subject for tonight is life history. And as we think about life history, we're going to be looking at Ruth's uh, story, really. But it begins with Naomi, not with Ruth. And in thinking about this story, I want to show you how you would use a story. One of the things that we're going to ask you to do during the time that you're taking this class is to do some research. And one thing we want you to do is collect the story, a life story of somebody else. And as you get that story, then you need to think about it and analyze it. Uh, so tonight we're going to take a story, this story in Ruth. We're going to analyze it as you would do if you got a story of someone that you were working with uh, to try to understand them and their culture. 
First of all, however, it's, it's interesting to look at this story and see how it begins and ends. Uh, the story opens in verses 1 and 2 with the, 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 the statement that there was famine. Uh, there was some critical time, and this famine had some consequences. Uh, because of the famine, they went to Moab. And as they, they went to Moab, they settled down there, and they tell us that they stayed for a long time. And while they were there, Naomi lost her husband and her two sons. Now, this was a critical issue for them. And as you look at the, the outline in the text, you'll see that uh, I'm stepping the outline in toward a center point. The structure, the literary structure of this text is what we call, uh, in the study of the scriptures, chiasmus. Uh, that's C-H-I-A-S-M-U-S. Uh, and chiasmatic structure is a structure where the meaning of the text, the, central, the, the main point of the text is in the center. Uh, and as you go in through the text, you build toward the key theme. So uh, we have famine. Uh, they went to Moab. And Naomi lost her husband and wife, I mean her husband and her sons. And uh, then uh, she heard that there was good news back in, in Bethlehem again. And so she decided to go back. Uh, and she and her two, her two daughters-in-law set out to return to the land of Israel. As they started on this, Naomi had second thoughts. Uh, she said to herself, uh, these two women are not Israelite. They aren't of my people. They're not of my culture. They're not going to understand my people. Uh, and so she turned to them and she told them to go back. And as they discussed this together, uh, they, Naomi really encouraged them to return to their own people and stay there. The text tells us that, that she kissed them. They wept. Uh, and as they considered this, uh, they both said to her, no, we're going to go with you back to Bethlehem. Uh, now, this particular process and this particular step was a critical time for them. And we're going to get into why they did this as we look at it later. But uh, Naomi's conclusion and the reason she's going back comes at the very center of this text in verse 11 to 13. And Naomi said, go back. Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? And you remember, as I read the story, she, she gave them these two reasons. She said, first of all, am I going to have any more sons? Now, for us, we don't really understand what that means. Uh, to put that into our context, we really have to understand her culture. We have to know why that was an important issue for her. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But uh, Naomi concludes that the Lord's hand has gone out against her. And so as you reach the center of this text, you see that the issue of Naomi's life is that God is against her uh, and that life is not worth living anymore and she might as well send her daughters-in-laws back home that for her, it's over. Mm. Life is futile. She sees no purpose and no meaning and she's just going to go back home with her relatives. Uh, as she says a little bit later, uh, I went away full and I came back empty. Now, as we look at the story and how it unfolds, we find weeping and kissing again. Uh, this time, Orpah kissed Naomi goodbye. The first time they kissed one another, they said, well, we're going to go with you. But this time, uh, Orpah kissed her goodbye. They wept again. Uh, and uh, the scripture tells us that Ruth clung to her. Uh, and Naomi told her, go back. She said, you need to return to your people. <clears throat> but Ruth then uh, gives a different message. Ruth says, I don't want to go back. Don't urge me to go back. Uh, and uh, if, if we look at the parallelisms we see in the text, this particular uh, comment by Ruth is parallel to the verses 8 and 9, in which Naomi has urged them earlier to go back. Go back. She's doing it again, telling her to go back. Uh, but Ruth refuses to go back. And it's interesting. Ruth makes a commitment. She says, your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. And then she even she, she, uh, gives an oath. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely if, I do any, if anything but death separates us. So this process that she's working on is a process where, whereby she is committed to stay with Naomi. Now, the story tells us then they went on to Bethlehem. And they came into Bethlehem. And when they arrived, the whole town was excited about them. Uh, and uh, then Naomi makes her comment. She says, call me Mara. Mara means bitter. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, Naomi means pleasant. And so this contrast between what her real name meant, pleasant, and what she wanted to be called when she returned, reflected her attitude and her outlook. God is against me, 
and there really is nothing for me in this life. Now, the wonderful thing about this story, it ends with a barley harvest. It started with famine. Okay. So you see the contrast. Uh, and as you look at this text, you have it in your, in your syllabus so that you can follow along. You see that there's a whole series of contrasts in, in the text as the story develops and unfolds, as you get at the central meaning. And as we go through the story, we'll keep coming back to the central meaning of the story. Because in each of the chapters that follow, it's organized in the same way. There is a structure that develops in parallel ideas to the central meaning in the story. Uh, and we'll see how that meaning changes as we go through. And that's a very important part of people's lives. As we think about the social organization focus that we have in this course, one of the things that we keep coming back to is that social life is always filled with meaning. And the meanings that people have are meanings that grow out of their understanding of themselves in relationship to who they are, in relationship to their society. Now let's move on because we want to look at the social context of this particular story and look at some of the things that are probably not familiar to you. If you think about this story, uh, you have to understand something about the social structure of Israelite society. They had what we call clans, lineages, and tribes. Now those three words, clan, lineage, and tribe, are words that you probably have heard before, but you may not understand wholly their meaning. A lineage, uh, and uh, th th basically a clan and lineage and a tribe are all organized around what we call the principle of descent. Have you heard that word before? Uh, we can have two kinds of, actually three kinds of descent. We can have patrilineal descent, we can have matrilineal descent, and we can have what we call ambilineal descent, meaning going through men or women. The Israelites practiced patrilineal descent. They counted relatives through men. And if you were born of a sister, you were outside of the descent group. You could only be in the descent group if you were born of one of the men in the particular group. So in this situation, here you have Naomi, who is married to Malan, uh, and uh, she has two sons. They provide for her descendants, who would then have children and continue her descent group. But both her husband died and her two sons died. And so all of her heritage is finished. She has no one else to care for. If, if, uh, and these two daughters-in-law really are not significant for her. They had no children. And so Naomi really is a dead end. Uh, her descendants, she has none. And so for her, her whole life is, is in, in a sense, ending because of this situation. Now, we're going to talk about kinship later on in the semester in, in a greater detail, so I won't emphasize this tonight. Uh, they went to Moab, which was a foreign country, but the, the people in Moab were relatives. They were descendants of Lot. Uh, and if you remember, Lot was a nephew of Abraham. Uh, and so, in fact, the people of Moab were, in a sense, patrilineal relatives of the people living in Bethlehem. But they were very distant relatives by this time. And so in that, this kind of descent system, they were so diff distant that they were considered outsiders. They were not considered relatives. They were considered a different people, the people of Moab as opposed to the people of Israel. And so <clears throat> uh, it's a foreign country. Now, the interesting thing is that if you look at the marriage situation that we have uh, and see the, the significance of that, we have Moabite women not accepted in Israel. If you remember reading the law, it says that a Moabite will not be allowed into the temple to worship until the tenth generation. So if we followed the law accurately, even if Naomi had had children, those, I mean, if, if Ruth and, and uh, Orpah had had children, uh, technically they wouldn't be allowed in the temple until ten generations later, after they'd remarried back into the Israelite clans. Uh, so Moabite women were considered outsiders but they had similar marriage customs, and that really is the key issue. In the marriage practice of these times, they practiced what we call bride price, uh, or, or bride service. If you remember the story of Jacob, when he got married, he worked for seven years. If you remember the story of Abraham, uh, when he sent his servant out to get a wife for Isaac, uh, he sent great gifts, uh, all kinds of gifts, to the family of his brother uh, to basically bring back Rebecca. Uh, for Isaac. And so there was a great deal of wealth or work that had to be exchanged to get a wife and a family. Now, when, when you married, uh, one of the things that happens is that the woman then changes her family allegiance. 
She no longer belongs to the family in which she has grown up. She has been purchased with a price, if you will. Uh, they have given significant resources for her. And so from the time she marries, her labor then belongs to her husband, her children belong to her husband, and her sexual uh, being, in a sense, belongs to her husband, that she cannot give herself sexually to anybody else. Mm -hmm. And so the rights to children, the rights to sex, and the rights to labor now are transferred with the transfer of bride wealth. Now, the reason this is important in this story is because Orpah and Ruth have been paid for by Naomi and Malan. There was bride wealth exchanged. And so in that exchange, the husbands, Malan and Killian, and the mother-in-law has rights to the labor of these girls. And they have rights to the children that these girls would produce and rights to their sexuality. And so basically, Naomi owns these two girls. I mean, literally, she could insist that they go with her back to Bethlehem. She could insist that they wait until she had a son, and then she could insist that they marry the son that she had because they paid for the bride wealth. And in the customs of these two groups of people, when your husband dies, uh, that you must marry your husband's brother. Uh, it's called the leveret. If you've read the Old Testament, you understand that. So that, that you, know, you didn't have the freedom to choose your new spouse. You really could only marry somebody within the family uh, that you belong to. So Ruth and Orpah belong to Naomi. And so what Naomi does here is very significant. What Naomi says to them, I'm setting you free. You no longer are obligated to me. You don't have to work for me. You may return to your families. You may marry again. And I'm not asking for anything back from your relatives. I don't want them to repay the bride price. I'm not asking for any compensation. I'm setting you free. Uh, well, obviously, they had a good relationship with Naomi. Naomi cared about them. She loved them. Uh, and they loved her. And they wept, this story tells us. But if we look at the legality of the facts, legally, Naomi did not have to set them free. She could have insisted that they take care of her in her old age. What she was doing is she was dissolving her retirement pension. She was saying, you know, I'm going to let you go. I won't insist that you care for me in my old age. You are free, and you can go back to your families. Now, if you understand that, then you understand the difference between the choice that Orpah made and the choice that Ruth made. You see, the choice that Orpah made was to be free, to go back to her family, to not have the obligation of caring for this old woman in her old age, uh, and to marry again and possibly have children. And to not have children is a great disgrace in these societies. To be without children is one of the worst. Naomi was feeling that. I'm bitter. I'm empty. I have nothing, because I have no children and no hope of grandchildren. Uh, Ruth said, I don't want to marry again. I will go with you and I will take care of you in your old age. Uh, and so her commitment for Naomi was a very significant commitment. Uh, rejected freedom, continued to agree to stay in the relationship uh, that really was part of her marriage vows. All right, the other thing that we have here that's culturally significant is the notion of the naming. Uh, Naomi, is, as I mentioned earlier, means pleasant. Mara means bitter. Naomi says, change my name. How many of you ever thought of changing your name? Some of you may have. Okay. Uh, you know, this is something that people did because the name meant something to them. It had a powerful meaning of who they were and how they felt about themselves. And so Naomi at this point says, I want to change my name. I'm no longer happy with who I am. I just call me Mara. Just call me bitter because of where I am. All right, as we think about this story, I want to ask you some questions. Uh, we're going to work at some preliminary social analysis. And when you get a story from someone that you're working with, you'll want to do the same thing. You'll want to ask them some questions. The first question is, what are the material interests that provide motivation for the people in this story? Now, I want to start, first of all, by saying, I'm assuming that there are some. Okay? That people in their relationships with one another have some kind of material interest. So as you look at this story, what do you find? John? Well, um, the reason that Naomi leaves in the first place is because of the famine. And so there's the, the interest just to survive. OK, excellent. Survival, getting enough food. All right, what else?
What are some of the material interests I just talked about? You wouldn't have thought about if I hadn't given you the background. The bride price. Okay, the bride price. Very important part of this whole thing that the, the marriage has occurred with the substantive transaction between two family groups. Uh, and so there is a bond that is, is solid because of some substantial economic exchange. Okay? Anything else? Sons? Sons? Sons, okay. Sons are very important. Having children. Uh, you know, we don't think of children as being somehow materially uh, significant, but they are materially significant. They eat a lot, <laughs> they cost a lot, but they also work and they also care for you when you get old. Uh, and so the whole notion, you see, of having children and the children are an investment in your future in days when you didn't have Social Security and old age pensions, uh, the children are a very important part of your life. And so they actually are part of the material consideration of the story. All right? Anything more? What led uh, Naomi to consider going back? Family. Okay, family? Her husband died. Okay, but, but what news did she get? They're doing well back home, that's right. They're getting, they're getting harvest back home, that, that things are growing, that there's rain again, that, that things have changed, and there's no longer famine at home. So if you look at the story, the story is really strongly based in terms of some very fundamental economic considerations. Uh, and our social lives have to consider that, because that's what social life is about. It's organizing ourselves in such ways that we can live, that we can feed our children, that we can have a continuing family and relationships with one another. All right, um, <clears throat> the issue of meaning. What are the significant meanings that are part of this story? What, is what are Naomi's conclusions about her own plight? God is unfair. Peter? Again? God is unfair. Okay, God is unfair, all right. Uh, what did God do to her? took everything away. Mm -hmm. You know, that's right. So she sees that God is somehow against her. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's an important part of the story. What about the meanings for Orpah and Ruth? Ruth Okay, good. Uh, there's some substance in the relationship she had with Naomi that kept, that motivated her to stay. All right. Another meaning. What for Orpah? What was the meaning for Orpah that had power? Freedom. Okay, freedom. They got freedom from the bondage of the marriage relation. I mean, you know, the vows are vows. They're, they're for life in this culture. Uh, and so there was freedom from those vows. Uh, what hope did she have? She could start over. She could start over. That's right. That she could have children. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to marry again. Because technically she was not allowed to marry again unless it was Naomi's son. And so this was a very important meaning for her. Now you see why it's important to dig deeper into a cultural situation and try to understand what's going on between people. To know what meanings are part of their decisions and why they make the decisions they do. And if you don't have a little bit of this understanding of the re arrangement that is involved in the marriage, you don't know the meanings then that are powerful to the people when they are making these tough choices that they have with one another. All right. Um, we have legal and material interests, and I talked about these uh, just briefly. Uh, the legal interest. What legal interest does Naomi have? Okay, the, the daughters-in-laws are in essence hers. They belong to her. Uh, whereas the daughters are in, in, uh, legally uh, belong to Naomi. Uh, and so these two legal facts are important for us to understand. Now we're going to catch more legalities as we get later on in the story. Uh, and so we keep on analyzing it. We'll look and see uh, as you, you get to the last chapter of Ruth, there are real concerns about legal issues there as well. But uh, in this chapter, it's not so explicit. 
because the cultural background is not made clear. The people in Israel understood these things. Mm -hmm. They didn't need a lecture to clarify what was going on in terms of their cultural relationship. But we don't understand them. And so for us, uh, it, it's important for us to have a sense of what the legal commitments and obligations are. Now, as you work with other people, it's important to learn their cultural legalities. What is it do they think about their relationships? What do they, they deem to be the legal responsibilities that are part of it? Even if it's not written, there's what we call customary law. Mm -hmm. This was not written law, this was customary law. It was mm -hmm. part of the understanding that people had as to what their commitments were to each other. And of course, the last thing is, is the question of meaning. Uh, and we already looked at the difference between the meaning that Ruth and Orpah had. Uh, they obviously had different meanings, and that's why they made different decisions. And so if we look at how they made two different decisions, it had to do with things that were important to them and the meanings that they had that were essential in their lives. Now, as we look at your projects for the semester, uh, one of the things that you have to do is find somebody who is an informant uh, and uh, then begin to find out about their life story. How many of you have an informant already? Can I see? Anybody? OK. Got a lot of work to do between now and next week. Uh, we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray at the break that the Lord will bring the right person into your life because that really is important to your success in this. If you are out on the mission field, then this is not a problem. You've got people all around you that uh, you want to know and who could provide great relationships for you. Uh, and one of the things that you'll find if you invest in these people, you'll develop much deeper relationships by doing this project than you would ever have through casual uh, superficial contacts. One of these evenings, I'm going to bring Jim and Jeannie Lowell into the class and have them share with you their testimony of what this project did for them when they did it in India. Uh, it's just incredible what they, the, the relationships that they established uh, in a community of people who are not Christian, who do not have any interest in the Christian faith, and are very suspicious of Christians. But this project and social organization just opened the door wide to those people. Uh, they were obviously of another faith that I won't mention uh, in our lecture this evening. But the, the key thing about this is that this project allows you to, to learn to know them in an in-depth way. And in doing that, you establish relationships that you would never do otherwise. As we look at trying to find somebody, how do you do it? One of the things that you can utilize is what we call personal networks. You, you have people that you have contact with. Uh, on a regular basis. I don't know where you live. I don't know who the people around you are. Some of you are just new here to Southern California. Uh, you have uh, maybe uh, no contacts at all. You've just come into this area. Uh, for example, David, you're from Indonesia, right? I would suggest to you that uh, you try something. Uh, if you don't have a network of non-Christians here, try an Indonesian restaurant. Uh, go in there and introduce yourself. Uh, to talk to the people uh, and let them know where you're from, just make a contact. They're probably much more friendly to you here than they would be in Indonesia. Uh, and it would give you a chance to even talk in your own language, to interview somebody there. Uh, but if you want to do something, somebody outside of your own culture, if you want, then uh, you can go up to one of our convalescent homes here, uh, just north of Biola, and uh, find some people there that are Americans and learn to know our American culture. And that's even more interesting. I'd like for you to try to learn to, to do research with somebody who's not from your own culture. Uh, but uh, there are lots of people in Indonesia that are not from your culture. And if you just looked for a, a group of people who were from a different language group than the one that you came from, uh, you could actually do a project that would connect to the kind of ministry you envision when you return home. Uh, personal networks are one way, neighborhood contacts, you're staying in an apartment building, uh, you uh, go down to a gas station, you go to a grocery store, there are people there that are different from you, uh, you might just ask them if they would have mercy upon a poor student uh, who has this research project to do and desperately needs somebody to help them. And you'd find that, lo and behold, there, there are people out there that are friendly and kind and who would have mercy on a poor student. Uh, there are service institutions for internationals here in Southern California that you could possibly use. You could go to one of the universities and uh, maybe uh, visit with some of the international students in those universities. Uh, there are churches around that have ministries to international students who might help you make contact with international students who are not Christians. Uh, there are also uh, 
organizations around that are of different religious faiths. There uh, is, for example, a large Buddhist temple uh, down the road here in Hacienda Heights. There is a very uh, um, a Muslim mosque over in Anaheim area. Uh, there, there are a lot of different places that you could go around where you could meet people in institutions. And then uh, I mentioned the restaurant, public businesses, where you're a customer. Wherever you have contact with people and, and, and where you actually take their services and pay them money for it, uh, they're interested in good relationships with customers often, and they might be interested in having you come back as a regular customer. And if you chose the time to go back when they weren't busy, they'd even be willing to talk to you about the project that you're interested in. So those are some of the possibilities. As we look at this project, uh, interviewing is an important part of the work. And uh, one of the things that you'll, you'll do is you will actually do an interview. Uh, interviewing is actually very easy. In just a few minutes, I'm going to interview James here. Uh, and uh, you'll see that with somebody like James who enjoys talking, why this is just a breeze. Uh, you know, it, uh, it really can be very easy. Other people are not so, so easy to work with. But uh, there are a series of questions that I've given you in the syllabus that have to do with uh, where people are from and, and what uh, their, their place is like. Uh, you know, your key thing is you want to have a relationship with a person. One of the big mistakes to make on this is say, I've got a list of questions. Uh, and go formally down through your questions and then say goodbye. You know, this really is a relationship building process. Mm -hmm. And the key thing that I want you to realize is that this person is very important. Uh, your ultimate goal is hopefully to share your faith with this person, to let them know that you love the Lord Jesus and, and share with them something about what he means to you. Uh, with perhaps the hope, with, with clearly the hope, and with perhaps the opportunity to share them more deeply, share with them more deeply about your faith and lead them to Christ. So, in that kind of a thing, you, you really don't want to make this a checklist project. You want to make this a project where the person really is in focus, where you care about them, and where they're a person that when you're finished with this project, you'll continue to have a relationship with. One of the things that I tell students who do this if you spend 10 weeks with a person, and then abandon them. And I find out, I'll turn your grade in the course from an A to an F. <laughs> because, you know, I'm threatening emptily now because I'd have a very difficult time doing that. But truly, that's the worst thing that you can do. You know, when you really get to know a person deeply and then you don't ever contact them again, uh, it says to them that you use them. Uh, that you were really only interested in getting this information for your class and you had no real interest in them as a person. So I want to caution you right up front in the beginning. Uh, this project will bring you into an in-depth relationship with a person. And that's a person that you probably will want to keep on going. That doesn't mean you have to meet with them every week. I don't mean that. But it means that you call them occasionally. You send them a note. Uh, you, you recognize them as a friend at holidays. And, and if they want to keep on the relationship and they call you, then you want to continue that relationship as part of your life and your ministry. You may, a time later, have to leave California, and you might not have an opportunity to be with those people again. But it's really important that they not feel that you abandon them, that you really feel like you care about them as people. So it's a commitment that you need to make in the beginning to do this project. Now, there are a number of different things that you can do in the interview process, and I'm just going to go through this very briefly. Uh, the, the first thing that you want to do is to, uh, to keep this an open-ended interview. Uh, it's something that uh, you don't try to force people into the questions that I give you. Uh, I don't really, I give you these questions as places to start, but really the goal is to help them to give you their story. And as they give you their story, then the questions then help you to, to work further into their lives. Um, it is for this particular project, it's 10 weeks in our semester, and your goal is to try to appreciate and learn about their culture as you work with them. Uh, at this particular point, I think what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to ask James to come up here and sit down next to me. Uh, and uh, I'm going to take uh, a few minutes and uh, I'm going to ask James some of the questions that you have in your syllabus. Uh, instead of talking about these questions, you have them in front of you, you can read them very well. Uh, and uh, James, you can put that microphone on your tie there and uh, have a seat. And uh, then uh, you and I can talk together for just a, a little bit. Uh, 
Tell us a little bit about where you come from, James. Uh, I come from Kenya. Where's that? It is in uh, Africa, okay. East Africa particularly. Okay. And um, Any particular part of Kenya? Yeah, it is um, southeast of Kenya. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is the weather hot there? Is it cold? Is it, uh, what's, what's the place like? Is it hot like California today? The weather is uh, relatively uh, hot, uh, but the difference is there is always a breeze. Uh, and we have clouds hovering over the land. And uh, the altitude, particularly in my area, is uh, approximately 4,500 feet. Okay. And um, Nairobi is 5,500. And uh, uh, with that altitude, um, we have breeze. It may be hot, mm -hmm. but we have breeze coming and uh, Particularly the clouds coming. Sounds, it sounds like you like it there. Yes, uh, like today it was very hot. In <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, this this particular place, uh, what does your family do? Uh, in uh, in Kenya. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my family uh, do some farming. Okay. My father keeps animals, uh, cows. What, what kind of animals? Cows. Um, and bulls mm -hmm. and sheep and goats. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are real economical um, uh, animals. Mm -hmm. He can sell them when he needs money, okay. he, when he needs meat, particularly when we did good things as children. Yeah. He used to slaughter one to, to give us a good uh, meal. When you were a child, uh, you know, is there an exciting event that you remember, a story that you could tell us? Uh, when you were small that just sticks out in your mind is a wonderful occasion? Yes. Uh, when I was a, a young boy, um, one of the things that happened to me was, um, was to make a beehive. Oh, is that right? And um, that is when I had to really develop my technological uh, skills. So I went to the field and cut a, a tree into a, um, a small block which was uh, almost um, four feet mm -hmm. and then um, began to chisel it inside taking out the, uh, the material and threw that away and then made some covers mm -hmm. from one end to another and then what I did was I uh, we have a particular hub in the in the field so I went and came and did something there and um, did a little bit smoking, smoked a little bit, and the smell is really to attract the bees. Uh, so after finishing that, I made a handle, um, something hooked. Mm -hmm. So I, I hooked um, on the uh, beehive, mm -hmm. and then it, ha it had to have a curve because I would place it on a, on a branch mm -hmm. up there and tie it against that mm -hmm. branch. And so the beehive is, is floating down here, and it is hanging there. So the bees are free to come from any part of the country and come looking and smelling, looking at that good home. Mm -hmm. And um, they came to my home, I mean to my beehive, and they began to, to really uh, make beehive. What happens, I was watching, uh, one bee comes, and uh, he comes to investigate and goes to You sat out there and watched this the whole yes, time? Yes, yes, I watched it, I watched it, I had to. This is my first technological <laughs> kind of uh, discovery here. And I watched it came, making some marks, then it went back. It came with the other five. They came and went around, they went, and they brought a swarm. Hmm. And they came and the sound was <laughs> That's amazing. And I said, I made it. What did your father think of all this? This was so great. My father was proud of me. My father really did not uh, have a desire of uh, having beehives on his field. But I was looking at uh, what my grandfather did. I used to go with him to, mm -hmm. to, to, to the beehive and to get honey mm -hmm. during night and all of those things. I wanted to do that. I wanted to do that which I saw with my grandfather. Mm -hmm. 
That's fascinating. And how about your mother? What did she think about it? My mother said, oh, this is great. But then she said, let's wait and see if something will come <laughs> out of it. <laughs> and so, did anything come out of it? So what happened was um, we had some seasons. Mm -hmm. When there is flowering and uh, all of that, uh, the bees go and, uh, and collect nectar. They bring in. So they began to make honey. And as they make honey, they still make uh, give birth to to the young ones, something like this, and um, so you let one rain, one rain meaning one season, one season pass, and then the next season during summer, you go up there mm -hmm. um, in the tree, and then you lift up a little bit to see if there is something. Mm -hmm. You want to lift and see if there is uh, substance there. So I did so. But then I had now to face the greatest challenge. The greatest challenge is uh, you've got to get honey from this African killer bees. <laughs> and uh, killer bee, huh? I didn't know they were known as killer bees until I came to America. <laughs> but I did not have a mask. I did mm -hmm. not have anything. But we have a particular hub mm -hmm. that we burn, and its smoke, it smoke is very bitter. Mm -hmm. So I went with this herb, I burned it down there, and then I had a rope. I went there, tied my, my handle here, and then uh, I placed it down with that rope. I tied that rope somewhere. So I came down, and uh, you have to tilt it so that one end will face the, the fireplace. Mm -hmm. So I take this herb, and I open this one side here, and I bring the smoke here. So I tell them, move, guys, move, guys. I need something inside. So they move sideways, and it is dark. You don't go there when it is moon, moonlight. You don't do that. You just go there. So what happened that day, the bees moved away from my way. And so I went with my empty fingers and uh, looked and saw there was honey. So I had a knife. I cut that, placed it in my uh, plate. Another one, another one, another one. And I had some. Uh, I had to test some. This is nice. So I, I did that, but you have to uh, leave some there mm -hmm. so that they may have food and also some of their young ones mm -hmm. who will in the future uh, uh, become the adult bees and mm -hmm. then begin to make more and more honey. And so when I took it home, my father was there, my mother was there. They were happy. Mm -hmm. That's okay. wonderful. How often had you done that with your grandfather? Uh, many times. Mm -hmm. In fact, many times, I, I, when he was going, I was going with him. Hmm. And I watched the whole culture of, of uh, dealing with bees. Mm -hmm. they, and they, they, they sting. Like, they stung me, but I told them, go away. They stung me. No problem. Mm -hmm. So it was like we had immunity to, to these things until I found the, the anonymous killer bees here. Huh. <laughs> what, um, did your grandfather ever let you try this when he was taking you out, or did you just watch him? No. No, I did not try it, but I watched. Okay. I really watched. So the first time you tried it was with your own behind? My own behind. Yeah, mm. That's amazing. Yes. Incredible. Um, as you think about uh, the kind of things that happened when you were growing up, uh, we, uh, you know, all of us have different experiences growing up. Uh, how old were you when this happened? Um, this happened when I was um, nine years old. Nine years old. Okay. Nine years old. That's remarkable. Nine years uh, old. Do your, did your father expect you to have certain responsibilities at that age, or was this, you know, did you have other work to do as a nine-year-old? Uh, yeah, I had work to do. I, I began to look after the cattle, mm -hmm. uh, the cattle of my father early, because I was the firstborn son. Mm -hmm. And with that comes responsibility, mm -hmm. and is to be sent into different places. Mm -hmm. You are sent there. My father has two wives, so I had to take care of the things in, his, mm -hmm. uh, in the home of his first wife. And I had to take care of things in my in my mother's home, and um, so I I was looking after Caro, I was cooking, mm -hmm. doing things. I began doing things early, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we would have some goats that were not very cooperative. We tied them with a rope, mm -hmm. while we take we took others to the fields. Um, so I did that, but in my spare time. I had to come and arrange um, within myself uh, how much time I need for my project. Mm -hmm. 
and three quarters was spent on my family um, economic, uh, I mean time economy. Okay, so you're working with the cattle and doing other things like that. Mm -hmm. Did you get to go to school? Was schooling a part of your time growing up? Or? Yes, school was part of my growing up. Um, in fact, at the age of um, seven I, is, is when I went to school. Mm -hmm. And um, it was not good because uh, I went away from the, the most interesting things. I thought being with Carol and doing those things, that was the only thing that there was. But I went to school, began to see teachers and other students. I was afraid of other people. Mm. So I'd not go for the first few um, days, but my mother made sure that I went. Mm -hmm. And um, when it sunk in me, school became part of myself. Okay. When I remember when in 1966, when I was in that grade, I was able to ask the seventh graders uh, who discovered River Niger mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. And they would startle, but uh, I knew it. I had read it. So I had known how to, re to read English and how to write. It was Munk Paka mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, is, is the one that discovered mm -hmm. River Niger. And um, now how did you learn to read English? Um, we come from a British um, orientation, and the British people uh, brought education to us mm -hmm. in a way that we had to quickly uh, learn their language. Mm -hmm. And uh, did, you, did you learn English from your father? Or? No, not a not a bit, uh, not even from my mother, mm -hmm. not even okay. from anybody. Okay, from the school. Okay, mm. primarily in school. Then. In school. Okay. School. Uh, is here in America we have. Uh, Family gatherings like Thanksgiving and Christmas and holidays like that. You're familiar. You've been to my house at Christmas time. Yes. Uh, do you have family gatherings like that in Kenya? And, <clears throat> and what would be a special uh, thing that you remember in your father's family house? In my father's family, uh, when he had to have some things uh, or some enchanter for the family, he would um, organize a meeting. For example, he may look at uh, the children uh, that are there and that are married. For example, I remember one day um, he, he discovered that his daughters were not doing good mm -hmm. where they were married. So what he did was he made a big party and he invited them mm -hmm. together with their husbands. Mm -hmm. And all of us that were there, we, we were there, so he, built, uh, he killed like uh, two goats, mm -hmm. huge goats, male goats, he goats. So um, we came and we ate. The women in the family cooked mm -hmm. and everything. And uh, so after eating, my father said, I have something to say. Mm -hmm. I, I have two wives and I have many children. But one thing I'm concerned about is that my children uh, behave well where they are married. And they begin to learn here. And I heard that my, some of my daughters are not doing good. And I wanted to say, I don't want to hear that story anymore. The husbands are here. And uh, I do not want any problems. I want you to develop good families that one day you will be old enough to uh, make a party like this one. So I commissioned my daughters to look into what they are doing carefully and take care of my name. I remember my father saying, my name is precious. Hmm. And he said, whoever is not behaving well, he must take my name off. Hmm. Yeah, you are not going to be called after Mbuva, but after somebody else. So I, I thought that was a very great hmm. turning point. Now that's, that's really a unique event then, right? That's yeah. very unique. It very was very unique. unique. I looked at it and looked at the daughters and said, have mercy, you know, yeah. because this is, <laughs> this is so strange. But my father has been a serious man, and he wanted his family to grow, and the daughters to take his good name to where they went, and really they took care of it. Yeah. Was your father a Christian at that time? No, very much into African traditional religion, okay. which is very strict. We'll talk about that more again. Thank you very much, James. Really Thank appreciate it. Thank you. You want to disconnect your microphone before you sit down there. I'll meet you uh, next time. Okay. We, uh, we uh, have...
heard a story, and what I've done is just showed you how to get a story. Now again, James is wonderful because he loves to tell stories, and he does it wonderfully well. Uh, but uh, we didn't plan this. You know, we didn't rehearse it ahead of time. We uh, Basically, James has this outline, but we just had a conversation together. We talked to each other. I had in my mind some kind of questions that I could ask. I kind of glanced at this page, you see, and followed it. But the whole purpose in your first interview is not to get answers to all those questions. The purpose of your interview is to begin to learn about the person, uh, to begin to pick up some things about their life. Now, if you think about the questions that I ask about the story of Ruth, uh, what economic interest did you hear in this story? Goats, cattle. Goats, cattle. The beehive. Okay. Uh, and his mother's comment. Okay. The mother's comment was, "We'll see. If there's anything that comes of it, right? Is this going to be economically productive or not? You know. So, uh, in looking at that, the." Their, her interest was, well, okay, great job, James, but will it produce any honey? You know, will it produce any honey? And, uh, you know, so were you pretty proud when that happened? I was very proud. In fact, I wanted to, uh, to prove to them I can do. Yeah. I can deliver. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so it, it's uh, part of that is his culture, the motivation that the children should be productive and that they should have something to contribute. Uh, and he, he watched his grandfather. To me, one of the most interesting parts of that story was how he learned to do the job. You know, uh, there was no formal instruction. Uh, there was no even prior trial. Uh, he just watched, and he watched, and he watched. And he went many times with his grandfather. And so when it came his time, uh, he had watched so long and so carefully that he knew what to do. Uh, now, that's basically what I wanted you to do, watch and see. Uh, how you interview somebody and begin to learn something about their story. But lots of people in the world learn in that particular way. Um, when we look at the meanings, what kind of meanings did we see in this story? Just very quickly, as we, we heard a story in 15 minutes, what were some significant meanings you heard from his life? The family name is important. Family name is very important. OK, good, good. Uh, what else? Okay, relationships. Okay, grandparents. grandparents. That's right. Very important relationship with the grandparents. All right. More. Schooling was important. Okay, schooling was important. His, his mother made him go. Okay, good. His mother made him go. You know, there was this uh, pressure from home to go to school, and when he wasn't real eager to go in the beginning, so spent his life in school after that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay. Anything else that you'd see in terms of meaning? Okay, at different ages, what things that would be expected him at different ages. Okay, that's good. Very good. All right. Uh, well, you see, you can process this. Uh, you can do this. You can get stories. You can begin to think through them. You can begin to ask these questions. Uh, we didn't really get into any part of the story that would help us see much about customary law or legal things. Uh, but if you were just to take a guess here, what would you say would be important legally? Uh, any, any, any one thing that stands out about this that might be of concern, okay, Pete? Um, well, he, the father took control even though the wife, his daughter's more married to some other people. So that contrasts from, from um, the Ruth story. Okay, all right, good. The father's control and, and his concern about the relationship with other people, okay. That's right, it, it's interesting, he was so concerned about his daughters and how they related to their husbands. Uh, and I think if we dug further and found about marriage, which we would do later, and what the obligations are in marriage, and what exchanges occur in marriage, that we'd see more of the legality of that in it. In fact, what he was afraid of is that the daughters, at the end, they would be returned to him. Because although the bride wealth was given, uh, if the husbands find the daughters are not becoming, they have right to return them to, the, to their fathers. Okay, we'll discuss that in the next hour. Let's take a break, uh, and uh, then we'll pick up in lecture two in a few minutes. Thank you.
and didn't feel bad about asking it. So. Sometimes in African setting, if you knew uh, how old a woman uh, was, then you would know if you would give her the respect that okay. you give your mother. Sure. If she's of the age of your mother. Yeah. If you'll notice in America, women tend to dye their hair uh, and men don't when they get older. Some men do it too. But women particularly do it because if they get gray hair, they're older and they look older and they prefer to look younger. Uh, and that's, again, this is part of the culture. It's part of the values that they have. My mother, for example, uh, is uh, in her 70s and uh, her hair is still dark brown. She dyes it. Her mother, uh, at 60, had perfectly white hair. And I'll bet you if my mother didn't dye her hair, hers would be perfectly white as well. Uh, I had an aunt who passed away last year, and uh, I never saw her with white hair, uh, but I'm certain that her hair was white, but she dyed it. Well, because the culture says this is good. Uh, and uh, yet for men, it's considered to be wisdom and uh, distinctive to have gray hair, and so uh, they let their hair get gray. Uh, although some still try to, to dye their hair and keep them looking young. But it's, it's not, for many men, it's not a sign of, of age. It's a sign of, of uh, honor to have gray hair. Uh, so it's a cultural value that, that's just part of the, the ethos of the larger culture, and each individual has to deal with that. And they make decisions in their lives about what is important to them and what they want to do. So as you work with people, you find they make those choices, sometimes to, to go against the culture, uh, other times to not. And uh, it's, it's one of those fascinating things. OK, we're, we're looking at this issue of collecting genealogies. Uh, what should we include and what should we not? Uh, our time is actually getting short. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop at this point. You have other things in your, your, uh, your material that you can follow. And I'm going to, uh, I've talked a little bit about the names. I'm going to go to a different computer program and we'll do James's genealogy. And then if we have time, we'll come back and talk about some of these other things. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. We will close this particular program and open up Bambuva's genealogy. All right. <clears throat> okay, in looking at <clears throat> the uh, collection of a genealogy, uh, there are a number of things that I've mentioned that we need to work on. One of them is to use names. I've mentioned that already. Another is to when you ask your questions, focus on parent and child and spouse relationships. Keep those in mind. And to use the descriptive categories that we talked about earlier. So James, uh, why don't you come on up here, uh, put your microphone back on, and uh, you and I will take some time and we'll talk a little bit about your family. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll start just with some basic questions like names. Uh, <clears throat> as, as we look at this uh, process, uh, what is your Kikamba name? My Kikamba name is Muli. Muli, okay. Uh, does that name have a meaning? Yes, it has. Um, my grandparents um, had only um, their sons give birth to, um, to girls. Okay. But then when I was born, it was like somehow, somewhere in their daughter's in-law, a, a born child uh, boy was forgotten okay. somewhere, okay. You know, like an egg or something. So uh, when I came, oh, Molly is born. It's, okay. it's to be called Molly. Okay. Because uh, uh, Kulwa is forget. Okay. And so the person would be Molly. That means the one that was forgotten somewhere okay. in the womb. Okay. Was. Excellent. All right. Uh, I hope somebody's taking good notes on this. Uh, you notice that we're going to call James Ego. Okay, Muli is Ego, the center of our genealogical chart. Ego means I, mm. the person. It's Latin, and it's just a way of identifying the person who will be in focus. Okay, uh, what are what are all of your names, James? My names then would be James Muli Buva. Okay, why are you called him Buva? I'm called Buva because that is my father's name. Okay. Uh, let's go on to the next question.
question, and what are the names of your parents? The names of my parents, um, now which parent here? My father, Okay. his, name, his father's name is um, Dolo. Now, your father? My father's name, uh, my father is Mbuva, okay. and then his father is Ndolo. Okay, we'll come to Ndolo in a minute. Uh, okay. And who is your mother? Uh, Kavele. Kavele, okay. Uh, in, uh, who are Mbuva's wives? Mbuva had two wives. There is the first one, Ngi, okay. and the second one is Kavele. Okay. Uh, so Kavele, your mother, is number two then? Yes. Okay. Uh, why did your father take a second wife? Um, there are many factors. Okay. Two of them uh, suffice our uh, purpose here. The first one is um, the father of my father was a friend with the father of my mother's father. Wow, that's complicated. <laughs> I'd have to write all that down to understand it, but do, you go ahead with the story. And. Um, and these men were very rich, and they would meet together and have stories. Mm. And they loved each other so much that uh, they wanted to solidify or rather cement their relationship. And uh, one day, the, grand, uh, the father of my mother's father said, I will give you one of my daughters. Mm. And one of his daughters was the daughter of his son. Mm. They have authority over mm -hmm. that. Okay. So, and uh, the father of my father said, um, okay, I will receive. So he received um, Kavele. Okay. And uh, my father was given Kavele as his second wife. Okay. And again, to have sec uh, two wives was a sign of wealth okay. and prestige in mm -hmm. the society. Mm -hmm. So my father, my, the father of my father wanted to have uh, his son mm -hmm. have uh, two wives. And um, the other reason is uh, the first wife mm -hmm. did not give birth to two sons. Okay. And uh, in, the, in the genealogy, you have the first one, uh, the firstborn child was a daughter, the second daughter, and my father was beginning to shake his head, and the whole family was saying, no, we do not have a hair, you know, mm -hmm. we need a hair. So but during that moment, uh, the grandmother and the father says, and the grandfather says, we need something here, we need a change. So when the friendship was being developed through the fathers, in the family there was a, 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 a strategy to get a, a second wife, and so this was so timely. Okay. And so when my mother was born, boom, the firstborn child, okay. Muli. Okay. Okay. When your mother gave birth to you, it was Muli then. You were the first son. Yes. Okay. Uh, who are in Guy's children? Guy has many children. Um, he has Kaveke. Okay. And Nulu. Okay. Are they girls or boys? They are girls. Okay. Yeah, these are the first two. Okay. Mm. Uh, and then there are other girls that follow? Yes. Did she have a son? She had sons at the end, at two the of end. them. Okay. Yes. They were her last children then? Her last children, yes. Okay. Mm. Are any of them living? Yes, one of them is living. Is known as Mutinda. Okay. Good. Um, who are Cavelli's children? Cavelli's children are Moli, okay. Mino, and um, Mukonyo, okay. Kyoko. Okay. Mutongi, okay. Dolo, okay. Okay, boys and girls, right? Well, who no. is who? Was, and that there's another one. There's Dunge, okay. And this, there's Manasse. Who is the second? Uh, the second is Mino. Okay, that's a girl. Yeah, that's a girl. Okay, and the third is? It's a girl, Mukonyo. Okay, and the fourth? It's a boy, Kyoko. Okay, all right. Um, I won't go further because. Uh, we, we should be writing all that down, and I don't have my pencil with me today. Okay. Uh, but uh, I did put it on the computer, so hopefully those that are watching can, can pick it up. Okay. Who are the eldest children, then, in your family? The oldest in my family. What is family? Your, your, father's, your, your mother and father's children. Okay. Your, your father's children, I should say. Okay, my father's children, the oldest are 
uh, Kaveke and Dulu. Okay, all right, and and then I was uh, I was born at the same time with my father's first wife, um, uh, daughter who was uh, Mukulu. Okay, and so we came the same. We came together. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, for the sake of the students watching, if you notice on the screen, I have Muli is the father's eldest son, F-E-S, uh, and I have Kaveki is the father's eldest daughter. Now, I don't know if that's important in this genealogy, but uh, we're tracking it just in case it might be. Uh, and we use those particular symbols to help us keep clearly in mind what relationship they have. Uh, I could have put more on, but for the sake of space and typing, I didn't. Uh, I happen to know uh, when James and I talked about this earlier, that these, these are the, the elder ones. But you see when you ask in person, the data comes a little differently than if you got it in writing. Uh, and we're finding out more information. Uh, I asked, actually asked James to give me a list of his family earlier so we could put this on the screen. He didn't give it to me in relative age. But when I asked it, you notice he gave the children in their sequence in which they came. Uh, so if I were writing it down, I would do it in that particular order. Uh, let's go on. Uh, what is the importance of being eldest, James? Um, <clears throat> that is um, a place of power, prestige, and wealth. Okay. Because the firstborn son, in particular, um, gets half of the wealth of the family. Okay. Half of the wealth? Mm -hmm. What happens with the rest of it? The rest of it is divided um, among the rest of the children. Okay. And uh, these children are boys because the girls are married to other families to establish their own mm -hmm. uh, families there, and th so their children are recognized on that okay. line. Is it important? Is the eldest important for girls as well? Do they have special privileges? They are only important uh, in their husband's lineage. Okay. Yes. So uh, your eldest sister would not have any unusual influence in your life, then, uh, or in in your relationship with uh, your brother's children? No. Um, when she's married from our family, that's it. She has to establish herself in the other family. And that's why my father had to call them and tell them, I don't want to hear anybody doing things which are not becoming. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. Who are Mbuva's parents, mother and father? Uh, Mbuva's parents are Ndolo. The father and Nduku, Nduku. the mother. Okay. Um, in uh, do, does Ndolo have other wives? Yeah, Ndolo has uh, um, Lima, Gena. Okay. Yes, those two. Two, two other wives. Mm -hmm. then. Okay. Uh, who is the first one? The first one is um, Nduku. Nduku. Okay. And then uh, Lima and. Okay, who are Nduku's children? Nduku's children, uh, both boys and girls, uh, the oldest is um, Mbuva, mm -hmm. Kaleche, mm -hmm. Makonge, okay. Sukali, mm -hmm. uh, Kimiti, mm -hmm. Savali, okay. and Mumbua. Okay, wonderful memory, excellent. Uh, and you notice when I asked that question, I asked who were Nduku's children? not who are Mbuvu's children, because Mbuvu's children are children of three wives. Okay. Dolo, Dolo. Uh, I mean, Ndolo's children. I'm sorry. Ndolo's children are children of three wives. So you have to focus on the women in this case to get the accurate picture in the children. Uh, so we could ask, who are Lima's children? Lima's children are Mutunga and um, um, Chungu. Okay. Uh, and of course, we could go on and ask about the girls, and we could ask about the other wives' children. We don't really uh, need to do all that this evening. But you can see then uh, that uh, you follow this step by step using the names of the people that are there. That's the objective that, that I wanted to show you in this process. And you notice in each one of them, uh, I kept the symbols with it. Uh, and if you watch the symbols that I had on the screen, you see that that helps us to track exactly the relationship. Because you see, these names, we don't have a clue uh, as to what these names actually mean because they're so strange to us. OK, James, uh, who are your wives? I am married to one wife. I would marry many. <laughs> Legally, I'm allowed. But uh, 
since I came to know Christ Jesus, one was enough. So okay. I chose to have one. My wife is Rhoda okay. Molly. Uh, another night I'm going to ask you to tell us about how you met Rhoda and tell okay. us about your marriage. But okay. We won't ask that tonight. Okay. Uh, uh, who are Rhoda's and your children? Um, we have Mugo, the firstborn. Um, Mumbe, the second born. Okay. And uh, Mumbo, mm -hmm. the third born. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mwende, okay. the last born. Okay. Now, could you have told from the name which were boys and girls? No, of course not, you see. That's why you have to ask and you have to write it down. Uh, because otherwise, you're just going to be completely lost. Uh, now, we. So it's, it's really crucial to be able to keep that data. That's why these symbols, son and daughter, are so important and helpful to you, and you keep them connected to the names. All right. Uh, who is, is uh, Kaveki's uh, husband? Kaveki's husband is... Um, um, Mwicha. You, you told me in Dunga the other day, brother. Dunga... Uh, <laughs> Dunga... Dunga is the brother to that one. Oh, no. I'm in deep trouble. I've got the false data on the screen okay. over here. No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, you're fired. <laughs> uh, I'm just teasing you now. Okay. Um, we've got then, Kaveki is your sister, right? Yeah. And uh, he's, we we're calling, what his name is again? His name? His name, the man is... Um, Mueke? Yes. Mueke. Okay. Yes. So he would be your sister's husband then? Yes. All right. Uh, in this case, Kaveki is really not Kavele's daughter, right? Yes. She's in Guy's daughter? Yes. Okay. So technically you notice that I don't put on the screen that this is James's sister. Okay. The reason for that is that technically what she is is his father's wife's daughter. Okay. Uh, and we describe that father's wife's daughter because he's not the daughter of James's mother, okay? Because the man had two wives, uh, we describe the precise relationship. And so in this case, what I would do is I would describe James's full sister as Z, okay? And I would describe his half sister as father's wife's daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, because his father had a second wife. Now, it, I just want to stop and explain that to you because these technical details are details that if you track them accurately, descriptively as possible, then you don't get confused. You know exactly how people are related and you know the, the exact linkages. Later on, we'll ask him for kinship categories. In fact, why don't we just see if that's coming up next. Uh, who are Kaveki's children? Kaveki's children are Motunga and Moel. Okay, uh, both of those are boys? Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. If we look, then we have a group of people, and the next step is to get some kinship terminology. What is kinship terminology? It's the language they use to describe their relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we could begin by saying, what in, is the Kikamba kin term uh, for your relationship for Muo? Muo is Moana. Moana. Okay. Uh, Moana is uh, the word then. All right. The, Muo is, what do we have it up there? What son? Elder son. Okay, good. You got it. All right. So uh, what is the term that you would use for Mutunga? Mutunga is uh, Mwivawa. Mwivawa, okay. Mwivawa is uh, a different category. That's his sister's son. Uh, now, um, we could pursue this further. What we should do is ask it for other people. And I don't have time to do that. But you see what I'm doing? I'm asking him specifically about a person's name. What is the term that he would use for that person's name? What is the term that you would use for uh, Mumbe? Um, Mwetu. Mwetu. Okay, I didn't do that right, James. Uh, I forgot. I put Moana. Moana's boy? Moana's boy. Okay. Mwetu. Mwetu is daughter. Mwetu is daughter. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I goofed on that one. Uh, uh, he wasn't around when I did the computer program, so... Uh, I will rehire you. Good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we did a couple of others that might be interesting to you. The term that you use for Mbuva? No. No. Okay. 
the term that you use for makonge? Mwenduo. Mwenduo, okay. Mm -hmm. The term that you use for matemba? Mathembo. Mathembo, okay. Um, in Swahili, it's mjomba. Mjomba? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, you said in Kikamba it was uh, Mwenduo the other day. Yeah, in Swahili it is Mjomba. Uh, um, in uh, in uh, Kikamba it is Mwenduo. There is no difference between uh, the father's and the mother's okay. brother. Okay. What about uh, the term for Kaleke? Kaleke is Mwenduo as well. Uh, I didn't spell it the same, but it is the same, Mwendo. Uh, I made a mistake on the spelling. So what we see is one term for men and women. Okay, Mother's brother, father's brother, and in this case, father's sister. Okay, So it covers them all. Uh, unlike in English, we talk about aunt and uncle. In the Kikamba kinship terminology, they're all used the same term. Uh, now, there could be more to this, and it could be more complex, but at this point, you see we're finding out what he uses in reference to these relationships. Uh, and that's really what we want to. And, and instead of me having this on the screen, I've got a pen and I'm writing down, or a pencil and I'm writing down what he's telling me. And then I'll cross-check it with him later. But uh, getting these kinship categories helps us to see how they think and classify the people in their own cultural relationships. Uh, and so what you find as you work in other languages, it's different. Uh, from one language to the next. And actually, there are 14 distinctive different patterns, 14 distinctive patterns around the world. And they're really quite dramatically different. Uh, for example, the one I told you was there are no cousins. Everybody's called brother and sister. That's what we call the Hawaiian kinship terminology. The kind that we have in English, uh, where you have brothers and sisters being the children of the parents, and then the children of aunts and uncles are cousins, we call that Eskimo type of terminology. Why? Because that's what the Eskimos do, too. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, other types of, there's a type of terminology that we call Iroquois, which is based because the Iroquois Indians in upstate Rochester, New York, used that. And when people were studying it, that was the first case that they had. And basically, in that one, mother's brother's children and father's sister's children are cousin. Okay? And then the other ones, the father's brother and the mother's sister's children, are brothers and sisters. And so, you know, the, the way they do it is different from the way that we do it. So in looking at this, this gives you a basic understanding of why we go about getting this and what we're looking at. Now, the genealogical chart is really the product that we're working toward. And I've given you a genealogical chart here in the corner that helps you to see what, what the product could look like. I've abbreviated this. I left off a lot of people because uh, I wanted to fit on one piece of paper that I could bring to you here in the classroom. And so uh, this format could be much bigger. I just have taken and put just key people on. We start here, for example, with Muli, who is Ego. That's James. It's his Kikamba name. And uh, we have his wife, Rhoda. The equal sign connects them. And then we have down here their children. And I just put two of them, Muo, the son, and Mumbe, his daughter, uh, that are that are, represent this is one family. Uh, then I added just two of James's uh, siblings. sisters and brother, Kyoko and Minu, uh, are other members of his family, male and female. Uh, and they, of course, are all children of Kavele. Now, if we go to the children of Ngi, we've got then Mutinda and we've got Kaveki. Uh, Kaveki has a husband. I'd have the wrong one on there. Uh, and then we've got her children, uh, Mutunga and Muweu. And so this is another family. And we asked for the contrast between the terms for those children. And we found that these were, that the male child was Moana and uh, the male child, children over here were Mwivawa. And so you have that contrast in looking at those. We had some kinship terminology. Up here, we've got Mbuva, who's father, Gi, father's wife, Kavele, mother. Matembo is mother's brother. We didn't get names for these. I didn't ask for them, uh, so I could ask, but we didn't do it. And then up here we have the uh, Ndolo. We have his three wives. And uh, in this case, uh, we didn't get the vertical line, but this particular line should come down, connect for these children here, Mbuva and Mbuva's brother and Mbuva's sister. So 
that really gives you an idea of what a genealogy looks like. Uh, that's really what you want to try to work for as a finished product as you work with a tool. Do you, do you understand basically this process now? Uh, and you can do it, right? It's not that difficult to do. Uh, it's something that you'll find is not only fairly easy, but it can be very valuable to you as you work with your material. Okay, I want to encourage you to go out and try this out. Uh, find somebody to work with and basically work on this project. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week. And you can give me some feedback on whether you have an informant or not. Uh, let's uh, close together. Father, we thank you for this evening and for this time we've had together. Be with each one of these men and women now as they go out to serve you. And we pray, Lord, you'd give them just the right people to work with. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.